guess that means I'm up, so here we go. Anyway, if you have your Bibles, you'd like to open them to uh, Revelations uh, chapter 1, and we'll start there this evening. We're going to spend the next uh, few weeks looking at the seven churches of, uh, of Revelations, the seven messages that Christ gave to them. And we'll start here tonight in uh, Revelations chapter 1, just to kind of uh, get a little uh, introduction, and then we'll hop right into uh, Re- Revelations 2 here in just a few minutes. Uh, it starts off Revelations 1, verse 1. It says, uh, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and those, and keep those things which are written therein uh, for the time is at hand. Let's open a prayer and we'll hop right in. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for today and the uh, opportunity we have to gather as uh, believers and to hear your word uh, taught. I pray you just uh, fill me with your spirit. Help me to uh, say the right things, Lord, as it's your word that's being taught, not mine. Thank you for the opportunity. I sure do love you. And uh, thank you for all the folks making the effort to be here after getting off work and uh, to be here tonight. Thank you for each and every one of them. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we have here at Re- Revelations chapter 1. Uh, of course, we have this introduction in this first uh, few verses and just a, a little bit of an outline. Of course, the Apostle John uh, God used to deliver this message of Revelations to, and uh, he was in his 90s. And uh, so no matter how old you are, God can still do something with you. And uh, God had this plan for uh, John, and of course he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And he gives him this amazing revelation and these amazing messages to these seven churches in the first couple chapters. And uh, I can find it kind of find it fascinating. Verse three, uh, this book comes with a special blessing. We don't see this in any other uh, book in the Bible that I know of, but it says, "Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this proper uh, this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, uh, for the time is at hand." And God gives a special blessing uh, to hearing and to reading and to to keep this book in the book of Revelation. And uh, we see here in verse 4, just a way of introduction, John kind of uh, introduces uh, himself here a little bit and kind of ta- uh, salutes or greets those seven churches. And we have got a map up there, if Jake can throw that up there, i got one slide for you tonight. But of course, uh, these churches are written to the seven churches of Asia, and during the Roman times, the area known as Asia was in uh, western Turkey, uh, we know, I know of it today. And uh, so the country of Turkey now uh, is a Muslim country. Uh, but you have these uh, seven churches, the church of Ephesus, uh, Smyr- at Smyrna, uh, uh, per- Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then uh, John's on an island of Patmos, which is just kind of south and west of uh, Ephesus there on one of those little islands down there. This is where John is sitting when Jesus shows up to him with this amazing message. That's good, Jake. Thank you. So, and, uh, and so anyway, uh, he starts with these greetings to these churches in verse 4. It says, John, uh, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and uh, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood." And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, uh, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And then we have this amazing uh, moment described here, in, starting in verse 9 of John. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day. On a, on a Sunday morning, he's there on this island when all of a sudden uh, he sees Christ in his glorified form. And it says here in uh, verse uh, 12, he turns after Christ uh, uh, speaks to him. And it says, And I turned to see the voice uh, that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about uh, the paps with a golden girdle, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth were the, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at, my, at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. And in verse 19, he gives him these instructions to write these messages uh, to these churches. He says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars uh, that which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, or the, the pastors, the leaders of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So it kind of describes a little bit about what's going on. And uh, so these, and then uh, in chapters 2 and 3, we have these seven letters, or seven messages, uh, to the seven churches of Asia. And tonight we'll start off here with a message uh, to the church at Ephesus. And you'll notice... Uh, throughout all of these, they all, all seven of them end with, a, with the exact same phrase. It says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the key here, of course, with all scripture, including this, is to hear, to have a hearing ear. And hearing is so vital. And uh, God talks about to you that hears the word, but not just hear it, but doeth it as well. And we see in verse, one, or verse 3, the promise of blessing for those that hear and keep. And uh, so we have these uh, seven messages to these seven churches, and we'll go ahead and start off in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, unto the church, or uh, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hath labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, uh, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And we'll start here tonight with this message to the church of Ephesus. And if you're familiar with, the, the, with Ephesus, at this time in history, Ephesus was a, a, quite an amazing city. In a population and, and in power and authority, this city was second only to Rome at the time. It was a very vital city to the Roman Empire. It was a seat of government for the region, and it was a very powerful, very wealthy city. Of course, it was sitting, if you notice on the map, it was right there on the coast, uh, right, had free access to the Mediterranean, had a very large and busy harbor, and this city was a place full of action and full of excitement. And uh, one thing that this city is very well known for is it was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Does anybody know which one it was? It was the Temple of Diana, or the Temple of Artemis, uh, which we hear a little bit about in Acts chapter 19. Uh, but this uh, temple, this building that was, structure was built, was very amazing. It, of course, has been destroyed. Uh, but if you Google it, you look it up, it's just an amazing structure. We won't get into it in, uh, tonight just uh, for time. But uh, one thing they did, they built it on like a marshland. And uh, so that way it was kind of flexible so it could withstand earthquakes better. So just kind of an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, but this city had this amazing temple. It was a place of great knowledge. The library of Achilles, this great uh, ancient library was there. I'm sure there's a lot of scholars, a lot of theologians, and really intelligent people in this city. And it had a theater that seated 24,000 people something in a big NBA-sized stadium inside at this city uh, 2,000 years ago. So it was a massive city. It was a famous city. It was a very powerful city, uh, but it was also a city full of idolatry. 
Of course, if you have this giant temple to Diana, you're going to put lots of effort into worshiping this Diana. And they did. They had uh, many great festivals. You see in uh, Acts chapter 19 also, there was a great industry making little shrines or miniature temples that the, they sold there at the temple to people. Uh, they, made, they made a good tourist trap out of it, make a lot of money. And so it was a very happening, very I, I, a place of idolatry. Of course, this uh, Greek uh, goddess Diana was a, a pagan god and uh, uh, all sorts of wickedness that went around with that. But it was a city uh, that was famous, a, a city that was full of idolatry, but it was a city that had a church. And uh, we have the church at Ephesus. And it all started in Acts chapter 19 when the Apostle Paul uh, showed up in Ephesus in uh, around AD 53 on his secondary or his second missionary journey. The Apostle Paul traveled through Ephesus and started this church. And uh, there were lots of excitement that happened. If you read Acts 19, all sorts of wild stuff happened at Ephesus. You had uh, people uh, who were uh, some Jewish guys trying to cast out devils and got chased away by the devil and beat up. And uh, you got a big riot and uh, uh, protest taking place. You got uh, people storming uh, this uh, the theater and dragging people in, trying to get them killed and chanting for hours on end. It's just, just a madhouse, the city of Ephesus. But through all this, in Acts chapter 19, a, a church was established. And the Apostle Paul, of course, established this church. And uh, I'm sure some of his followers stayed there and helped work on this church and grow this church. And uh, nine years later, we have the book of Ephesians written uh, to the Christians at Ephesus and to the church. And uh, what an amazing uh, book Ephesians is. And in Ephesians, this church was actually... Uh, uh, was actually complimented for its love. It says in Ephesians 1.15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. And there's a few times throughout Ephesus that, or Ephesians that Apostle Paul is uh, commending them for their love and their love for each other, their love for God in this church. And it was an amazing place, a happening place. And uh, we come here, though, about 30 years after Ephesians. Uh, now the Apostle John, a very old man, God uses him to send this message Unto the church of Ephesus, and verse 1 again, it says, And unto the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And you notice that at the beginning of each of these messages, these letters, uh, there's quite the uh, just wordy, beautiful-sounding introduction to the one writing to Christ. It's like, man, it's like, didn't say, this is from Jesus to you. It's like, no, it's a, he that uh, holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and walks amidst the seven golden candlesticks. I mean, that's a cool introduction. And, uh, you know, you, you read through them all. They're all kind of amazing, very, uh, very eloquent-sounding, but they, they all relate exactly to how the letter goes. And it wasn't just put there to make the verse sound pretty or to sound cool. Uh, they were put there for a reason. And we see in this introduction that Christ is identifying himself to this church as the one who is to be the prioritized one. He says, uh, he, I, I hold the seven stars, the leadership in the church. I hold it in my hand. I walk in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, the seven churches. I'm in the center of all these. I hold all the authority and leadership. It is, I am the central one. I am the prioritized one. And what he's saying, and to, to get this church's attention, he says, I'm, I, this is, I'm the one who is the priority, who's number one here, who's giving you this message. And here's what he goes on to tell them. He says in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So this is some really good stuff coming here. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne, hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. We see here a church with an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, description of it. It says they were steadfast. So they, in work, in labor, and patience, they were steadfast in it. Or they were faithful. They were a hardworking church. If there was a job to do, they would do it. The people of Ephesus were busy. They were steadfast in their desire to serve the Lord. We see also they were strict in their discipline. They could not bear them which were evil. They didn't put up with evil. They didn't let the wickedness of this Diana worship into their church. They stood against it. They didn't let the, the heathen culture, the uh, whatever was the thing of the day going on there in Ephesus, it didn't affect them. They didn't put up with that evil. They spoke out against it. And I'm sure whoever the pastor was preached against it. Uh, that this, this is evil, this Diana worship, these uh, pagan festivals that go on, all this wickedness and uh, materialism of this city is wrong. And they didn't put up with that evil in this church of Ephesus. They were, they were strict in their discipline. And it says, uh, 
uh, and they were also sound in their doctrine. Uh, they tried teachers and people who claimed to, uh, to be apostles and teachers. Boy, they'd get their Bibles out. They'd figure out, oh, you know, that's not what the Bible says. This guy is a liar. We need to get him out of here. And they didn't put up with false doctrine. They were, they were sound in their doctrine. They knew what their Bible says. They knew what Apostle Paul had sent them in the book of Ephesians. They knew what uh, God had for them to do, and they didn't fall for all these false teachers. And again, we see it in verse 6, uh, some more doctrines, that they, deeds that they, didn't, they hated. They stayed away from it. And very, very sound, doctrinally sound church. A very hard-working church. A very uh, strict church that didn't put up with evil and the wickedness of society. They kept it all out. And in verse 3, it says, And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Uh, these people were faithful in their duty. They didn't quit. They weren't a church that when things got hard, they gave up. No, they labored. They were patient. Uh, they bore. They put up with stuff. And they just kept on going, kept on moving forward, kept on uh, doing the mission they were set out to do. And they were a faithful, hardworking, doctrinally sound, uh, strict against evil church. And it's like, this sounds pretty great. This is a great church. Uh, boy, if we drove by, I'm sure we'd see the first church, Ephesus. You know, they had their chariot routes running every Sunday, picking up kids. And they, they probably had their big, uh, uh, I don't know, their big sports Sunday where they ran around the Coliseum and all sorts of cool stuff. But they were doing everything right. This was a good church. And their people were faithful uh, every week, being where they needed to be. They were faithful knocking on doors. For all we know, they were getting along, treating each other. There's no, no issue with that whatsoever mentioned. Uh, they had their doctrine sound. They had their uh, King James Greek Bible. I'm just kidding. That probably didn't exist back then. Uh, but they had their, their Septuagint, uh, whatever they used back then. It was, I should all in Koine Greek, the official version. They had it all right. This church had it nailed down. But in verse 4, there is a problem that's so severe. God says, if you don't fix this quick, I'm taking the church away. I'm removing the candlestick because this, this, all this stuff is great, but it doesn't matter if you don't get this thing. And in verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see here, this church, while they had everything going on, they were doing all the right things. They were busy working and serving and laboring and uh, uh, doing what needed to be done, making sure all the holes were filled, the jobs were done, uh, taking care of everything they had forgotten who they were doing it for. And go back back to verse 1. Uh, he, Jesus introducing himself. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He says, well, I, guys, guys, here in Ephesus, I'm the priority one here. I'm the one in the center. I'm the one that all the focus needs to be around. Everything needs to be going around me. But this church had gotten so busy doing things for God, they forgot to give attention to the God they were doing it for. And it says here, um, their fire of love for God had grown cold. And I look at this illustration in Ephesians 5, an illustration this church would know very well, uh, because they were who this book of Ephesians was written to. But in Ephesians 5, uh, verses 22 through 33, we won't read it tonight uh, for time, but God compares the relationship between Christ and the church to a husband and a wife. It says, what's say, verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And I see here a good way to illustrate the situation that this church of Ephesus has found itself in. Uh, you know, when we, someone first gets married, a couple first gets married, we always refer to it, they're in the newlywed stage. And of course, the newlywed stage is all lovey-dovey, and just all oh, the love is there, it's wonderful. Uh, the compliments, I mean, the outfits are getting complimented, the hairdo's getting complimented, every meal is just wonderful and perfect, and uh, the time spent together is there. You go on a whole honeymoon trip, just the two of you, and it's wonderful, it's great. And uh, there's hand-holding and opening doors and lots of special time, just the two of you. And the love is wonderful in this newlywed stage. But what happens? Time comes along and busyness comes along. And if we're not careful, it can be easy to neglect our spouses in our marriages. And uh, pretty soon the compliments fade. You know, the things it, it, that used to be special when you were first married, you know, they're just routine. You know, she's, I mean, she, how many hairstyles has she had? I mean, it's just, it's just another one, you know. She's made this meal a hundred times. I've thanked her for it the last 50. Do I have to do it the hundredth time? Said, of course it's good, you know. Uh, I've done my thing. Uh, the meal's been great. It's just routine. The care lessens pretty soon. The hands are too full of kids to hold each other's hands. And, uh, you know, life just gets busy. And uh, the focus starts getting off of ourselves and get kind of uh, off of our spouse. And it gets moved on to something else that uh, uh, calls for its attention and calls for its focus. And uh, we're still doing all the things. 
We're still going to work. We're paying the bills. We're cleaning the house. We're cooking. We're shopping. We're doing dishes, planning trips. Uh, but the love isn't like it used to be. And uh, if effort is not prioritized on your spouse, a marriage will eventually grow cold and distant. And uh, I think we've all heard it uh, mentioned said once or twice by someone, but how often couples get to this point where, you know, the years have gone on and they've neglected each other, but they're just doing these, their things, and pretty soon they're just staying together for the kids. You know, that, that's not a marriage. I mean, they're doing all the things. They have kids, you know, they're a job, paying the bills, a house, and all that, but they're just staying together for the kids. The love is gone. It's not there anymore. And I think here is where we find this church at Ephesus. All the outward signs of the relationship are there, but inside... It has gotten cold. Think of uh, Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Uh, Jesus uh, comes to their house and it says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You see, Mary, she loved her Lord. She wanted to serve her Lord, and she got so busy doing so much for Christ, Martha did, that she missed the fact that Jesus was in her house. The Son of God was there. She could have sat with him and spent time with him and talked to him, but instead she got so busy doing things for him, she didn't do anything with him. And she missed out this great opportunity. And uh, does Christ have his place in your life? Or is he the central priority of it? Is he the main focus? Are we working our relationship with Christ around all the other demands of life? Or are we working all the other demands of life around our relationship with Christ. When examining the church at Ephesus, God wasn't grading their pastors and how well they spoke or what they did. He wasn't grading their people, uh, how hard they worked or how many there were. He wasn't grading their property, how nice of a building they had, but rather he was focusing on their priority. He was looking at their heart. He said, yeah, you're doing all these things, but, but are, are you doing them for me or are you doing them with me? Who, who are you focusing on as a church? And when examining this uh, church, uh, here we go. And just uh, some kind of an illustration here, a couple, uh, a conversation, we can, again, easy to get in this rut. Think of a husband saying, I went to work, uh, but a wife saying, but you didn't give me a hug and kiss goodbye. And think of a husband saying, I paid all the bills, but you never bring me home flowers. I got a bunch of overtime by working late, but you never take me out for a night. I got the lawn all cleaned up. You didn't tell me you loved me today. I washed the car. Uh, but you didn't help me with what I wanted done. I did the dishes. Yeah, but you didn't say anything good about the meal I made. I got the kids all bathed, but you didn't correct them for giving me grief all day. I went to church today, but you didn't give Christ any special attention. I put extra money in the offering plate, but you never gave extra time to Christ today. I helped with a project around the church today, but you never told Jesus you loved him today. I gave up my lunch hour to help out somebody else, but you haven't ever given, up, given it up just to spend some extra time in prayer. I helped out a friend or neighbor with a need, but you haven't shared God's love with them. I read my Bible today, but you didn't get anything out of it. Just checking off the list. And how easy it is as we go through life, we get in our routines, and it's very natural. We just, we just get doing it because we're supposed to do it. We do it because it's on the list. We do it because we're checking off. You know, i got to read my Bible today. i got to get through my prayer list today. i gotta, I got to go soul this Saturday. i got to be in church tonight. i got to make sure I get my tithe and offerings, and we're just checking off the list. But we, we forget to spend that time with Christ each and every day. We forget to make him the priority. We forget to spend time in his word, studying it and learning from it. We forget to spend time in prayer thanking him and praising him for his goodness and asking him to be with us and help us throughout our day. And it can be so easy to leave our first love and to prioritize something else. And here we find this church of Ephesus. They had it all going. They were doing all the right stuff. They were busy. They were working hard. They were getting the job done. Uh, but they got their focus. They got their priority off of Christ. And instead of him being the center of the church, they were just fitting him in with all their other things they were doing for him and uh, missing 
on a closeness and in a relationship they could have with him. Then verse 5, Jesus gives them the solution here. He says, uh, Revelations 2, 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first work, or else I come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So we see here Jesus, kind of a nice three-point outline here. He says, number one, remember, remember where, <laughs> from whence thou art fallen. Remember the good where it started. Remember those newlywed days. Remember where things were, uh, the love was filled, and it was magical, and it was wonderful. And uh, as people, we are so easily, or so good at forgetting things, especially as we get older. You know, the things, you just forget stuff. And as we see throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, God uh, always gave the nation of Israel. He said, set up these landmarks, move these stones, make this here so that you'll remember. It's often throughout Proverbs, don't remove the ancient landmarks so that the next generation can know and can learn and you won't forget. And uh, God calls us often throughout Scripture, almost 200 times, God says to remember, remember these things. And remember how it was when you first got saved. Remember uh, when you first got excited about something in the Bible. Remember that first passage or verse that really jumped out at you. Remember the last time God got a hold of your heart and you just needed to spend time praising and thanking him in prayer. Remember how it was when God first uh, got, of your, got a hold of your heart to do something for him. Remember that first time you shared the gospel with someone else and they got saved. Remember. And God says, first of all, if the Church of Ephesus, remember where you're fallen from. Remember, we used, to be, we used to be really close. You look back in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, 30 years earlier, and the Apostle Paul multiple times is commending this church for their love, their love for Christ and love for God and for the things of God. And now this church has left that love. And he calls them to remember. Uh, number two, he says, and repent. Uh, repent of your personal error. Change your directions. I love what uh, 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God calls this church to repent. Turn around. Stop going that way. Come back towards me. Admit you're in error. Admit you made a mistake. And come back to me. And that's what God calls all of us to do when, when we do get busy, which it'll happen to all of us at times in our life. When we have neglected God, we haven't given him the attention and the love that he needs, we need to turn back to him. We need to remember. We need to repent. And lastly, we need to return. It says here, uh, verse 5, and uh, repent and do the first works. Uh, return to those first things. Do what you did when it all started. I love the story of uh, Vince Lombardi. Packers fans in here? We got a few Packers fans. Ryan's a Packers fan. All right, Vince Lombardi, probably one of the mo most famous. Of course, the Super Bowl trophy is the Lombardi Trophy, named after Vince Lombardi. But when Vince Lombardi took over the Packers in uh, 1960, uh, they were a mess of an organization. Fifteen years prior, they were just the dominant franchise, winning championship after championship. Uh, but for 15, almost 15 years now, they have just gone into a slump, and the Packer organization was a mess. And, of course, Vince Lombardi, the great offensive coordinator from the New York Giants, gets hired as the new head coach, and he takes charge. And that first year, they have a pretty good year, but they lose in a championship game. And when all the players come back that uh, next, uh, 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 the next uh, summer training, training camp, they all, he gathers them all together, and they're all excited, expecting, you know, we're almost there, we're getting close, you know, we just need that next trick, that next a magical play that'll fool the team or the defensive scheme that'll trick the quarterback so we can get to the next level. Uh, but Vince Lombardi does none of that. He says he burned all the film from the previous year, and he starts, he gets all the men together, and he grabs a football, and he says, gentlemen, this is the football. And they go all the way back from the basics. And he didn't spend that summer teaching them new tricks and new schemes and new routes. No, he spent that summer focusing on the fundamentals, on how to block, how to tackle, how to catch, how to throw, how to run. And he got back to the basics, to the first things. And sure enough, by the end of the season, they won their championship 37 to nothing. And uh, Vince Lombardi never lost another championship game since. But it all started with them getting back to the first things and to the basic things. And in Matthew, uh, chapter 22, uh, verses 37 through 38, Jesus speaks and he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You look in Exodus chapter 20 of the Ten Commandments. What's the first one? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And uh, God wanted this church, hey, get your priority right. Make sure I am the first thing in your life. Before everything else, 
before all the other, uh, all the other action, the activities, the, the things that are on your list to do, make sure you make, re- no, make room for God, but you have God first and you form your time with him, everything else around that, because he is the priority. Uh, Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And God calls us all to make sure we have our priority right, that he is the first thing. And the word priority is a singular word. You cannot have a list of 20, your priority list isn't 20 things. Because if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. There's only one priority, and that is Christ. And it can be so easy if we're not careful to let other things affect our priority. And other things, pretty soon, I don't, we're so busy right now, we can't spend as much time as we'd like to with the Lord. You know, everything's are so hectic, I don't have as much time to pray right now. Everything's so busy, I just, I, I forgot to thank God or to, or to spend time with him today. Because things just got hectic and got busy. When really, this, that is the main thing. That is the priority. If anything were going to fall away, that would be the last thing that you would choose, no matter how things go. And uh, we need to be very, very careful. We keep our priority uh, where it needs to be. A marriage without the prioritization of the husband to the wife and the wife to the husband is headed down a very rough road with a disappointing end. Likewise, a Christian or a church whose priority is on anything other than Christ is on a destructive path. And uh, Jesus was very clear. He says, hey, if you guys don't stop, I'm taking the candlestick. I'm taking the church away. We're, we're going to stop this because uh, it doesn't matter all the good you're doing if, if I'm not the priority and if I'm not first. And Christ always must be the priority. And then in verse 6, we see kind of the sandwich method going on. We have the compliment, criticism, compliment here. Uh, Jesus compliments him for something else. He says, but, thou, but this thou hast, uh, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And this is a, a, a doctrine deeds that they stood against. And we'll probably delve into this a bit more next week because uh, another one of the messages kind of delves into this deeper. Uh, but it was a false teaching that this church stood against because, again, they were a doctrinally sound church. And then in verse 7, he says this says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And this isn't just for Ephesus. This is for everybody that has an ear. We all are to hear what is said in this message. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the, of the paradise of God. And uh, while this message was sent to the church of Ephesus, its truth is applicable to all who have ears to hear. And we see here the blessing of overcoming this wrong priority. And we see this word overcoming uh, in uh, Revelations, and then also John, he's the only writer who uses it in 1 John 5, talking about overcoming this world and uh, getting salvation. He says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And overcoming this world can only come by faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, that is the only way of salvation, the only way to heaven. But we see here the overcoming, uh, another more applicable to this exact uh, passage, but the overcoming of our wrong priority. He says, if we overcome this, and if we, instead of uh, focusing on other, everything else, we make God our focus, our priority, I love what it says, I will give to eat. I don't know about you, but I like eating. Eating is a very good thing. And uh, I smoked some ribs yesterday. They were amazing. But eating is a good thing. He says here, if you overcome, you get your priority right. You make sure I'm your first love. Your focus is on me. He says, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And I got in a long rabbit trail on this tree of life. And it's a really fascinating study. Of course, Genesis chapter 2, you go back, uh, verse 9, we see this tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And uh, we see it again in Proverbs chapter 3, talking about uh, the person who has wisdom will be like getting a hold of a tree of life. And, uh, of course, this tree of life is a type of Christ. And Christ is that tree. He died on the tree. He went to the cross to give life, to produce life for all of us. Uh, but so we see here, I will give you to eat. Jesus will give us to eat of the tree of life, of himself, of what he can provide. And uh, so we're having the best company at this meal. We're getting the best food. We're getting what Christ gives us, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We're eating this at the best place. And so, I mean, that just sounds like a good to me. The best restaurant, the best food with the best company. And that's what God says here. If you keep me first in your life, you make me the priority it's going to be the best thing. He's going to provide joy and happiness that nothing in this world uh, could ever provide. And when our love for Christ is a priority, 
It's like sitting down at that best meal in the best place with the best company. What Psalms 34 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man uh, that trusteth in him. A good marriage is often referred to as a little heaven on earth. Uh, And uh, when Christ is the priority of our love, a little heaven on earth is experienced in the heart of the believer. John 10.10, Jesus says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that ye might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And Christ came not to just save us eternally. He did do that. And if that's all he did, that would be uh, plenty. But he didn't just say, all right, I saved you. Have fun down there on earth. See you in 40, 50 years when you die, and we'll have a great time up in heaven. No, he said, I came to give you life, but also life more abundantly. He said, I, he says, I have an amazing plan. I want, you, I want to be close to you. I want you to be close to me. And I have so much fruit, so much good to give you. Of course, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And God has only good to provide for us provide for those who come to him, who seek after him, who walk with him. And true life on this earth is not lived for God, but rather with God. And God didn't call us to go do things for him. He called us to go do things with him. And that's what this church had got out of focus. They weren't doing stuff with God anymore. They were just doing them for him. And uh, pretty soon, just like a marriage, you're just doing stuff for your wife, but you're not spending any time with her. And pretty soon the love isn't there like it used to be. And if we're not careful as Christians, it can be so easy getting busy doing things for God. I'm doing good stuff. Man, I'm doing stuff for God. That's, that's what we're supposed to do, right? But well, we're not doing it with God. And God, God doesn't want us to, to do, do things out for him. He wants to be with us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to help us. He wants to strengthen us. And he wants to do it with us. And uh, so many people get so busy doing things for God. And they miss out. On knowing God, what Jesus said, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. And how, how sad a state that would be. Somebody, uh, I'm sure at, at some point, you know, a person could get this way. Uh, but you get to a point, uh, someone who's not saved, maybe just gets into involved in the cult. They're trying to do things good, trying to help other people, trying to serve other people, do what's right. But they never got saved. They never knew Christ. They never, uh, they, they never became a Christian. And, and, but they spent all this time doing things for God, but they were never with him. And oh, how, how a horrible thing that would be. And how easy it is to slip into that zone as Christians of constantly doing things for God, but not doing them with him. And uh, Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, that ye might find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, I want to yoke up with you. I don't want to send you out to plow the field on your own. I want to do it with you. I want to yoke up together. I want to be that farmer leading you and guiding you as you're in the yoke. I want to be with you in this journey of the Christian life. I want to be with you in this work of the church, of reaching others and uh, making a difference, teaching classes, running bus routes, uh, going soul winning. God says, I want to be with you doing it. I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to do it with me and how important that is. And it is so, so easy to get, get distracted, again, as I said many times, to just get busy doing stuff that we neglect our walk with the Lord. We neglect our time with him. We neglect our love to him. And what has been taking uh, your, pri- your love and priority away from Christ? This church in this great big city of Ephesus had it all going, uh, but they had left their first love. And they had let something else come ahead on the list. And whatever it was, and we don't even know if it's anything bad. Nothing's really, nothing evil or bad is mentioned. Sinful, you would think. Uh, they were doing everything right, but they had neglected the love, their walk, their closeness with their Savior. And uh, as a result, Christ said, if this doesn't get fixed quick, I'm just, I'm just going to take it all away because the Christian life is not a life to be to fake it till you make it. Uh, that's not what Christ has called any of us to. He says, no, I want you to go with me, and I want to go with you. And uh, I think the best way to sum it all up is in Ephesians uh, 6, 4, or 6, 24, the last verse written uh, to this church of Ephesus in another message. And, of course, Paul wrote this 30 years earlier, but the last verse, Ephesians 6, 24, it says, uh, you got Apostle Paul writes, Grace uh, be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.
men. And sadly, after 30 years, they'd forgotten this verse. They, they weren't loving God in sincerity. They were just doing the thing, you know, checking off the list and uh, how dangerous that can be and how we all must be careful and uh, make sure we're not just doing things for God, but rather we're doing things with God. And so we'll stop there tonight and uh, we'll pick up next week on the church a message to Smyrna. And, uh, so, that'll be one. so anyway, let's pray and uh, I think we'll be done. So, dear Holy Father, thank you for today and uh, for your goodness to us. Thank you so much for uh, the scripture and uh, for this lesson uh, and the message to this church of Ephesus. And uh, they were doing everything right, but they forgot the most important thing, and that was to love you and to spend time with you and to walk with you and help us all to be diligent with that as uh, we have lots going on and are trying to reach many for you, but help us not to be careful uh, to neglect you while we're doing it. Uh, but we'd spend that time each and every day in your word and in prayer and throughout the day when we get the chances to stop and to praise you. Uh, maybe it means skipping a lunch or two every now and then to spend an extra hour or so with you in prayer and uh, make you feel special and feel loved. And help us to do that. Help us keep our focus, our priority right, uh, because you are worthy of it all. Thank you so much for dying on the cross, for saving us, and uh, for giving us a chance to serve you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.